So um, it's a great pleasure to share um, this podium with Victor and Lite from Costa Rica. And I've been involved uh, using lasers for many years now, one of the first in Asia Pacific to use a sub-threshold laser in 2009. And I'm going to share my experience with you of my, uh, using this modality for diabetic macular edema. Uh, before I start, uh, I just want to do a quiz for you. Um, where's Frank? Yeah, what, do you know what car model that is? Golf. Which Golf? Uh, you, you see, Frank is a collector of classic cars. And uh, okay, what I've put up here is the on the left is the uh, Golf Mark One, which was in 1970s. In the 1970s, on the on the right is the latest Golf Mark Seven. And uh, they're obviously both cars, you know, Volkswagen Golf. But what's the difference? Um, at the time when the 1970s and the Golf Mark One came out, it was a revolution because having a hot hatch car was unheard of in those days. Everyone wanted big cars. It was a fantastic car to drive and still a collector's item today. But now the Golf Mark 7 is here, which is a huge generation change from the Golf Mark, Mark 1. And, and what is the difference between uh, these two cars? Essentially, electronic safety features, which are now mandatory in, in all cars. Um, I'm sure you heard of this before, the ABS system, the automatic braking system. When you drive a car, if you encounter uh, some obstacle, you brake suddenly, the car doesn't just crash, but you can avoid the, the obstacle and still continue on your path. More importantly is a thing called electronic stability control, ESC. If you are, if you are driving on a slippery road and you, and you lose control of the car, the, the electronics in the car diverts the control to the other tyres so you don't lose control of the car. And again, this is now mandatory in Malaysia. These features are mandatory in all cars in, in production now. And electronic stability control essentially is the same thing. It's just a software program on a car but different manufacturers have different names for it. For example, if you drive a Hyundai in, in Korea, it's called Electronic Stability Program. If you drive a BMW, it's called Dynamic Stability Control, and so on and so forth. But essentially, they're the same um, stability, uh, electronic features for safety in, in modern cars today. So going back to lasers, when I started out working in the year 2000, almost 17 years ago, I was using the Quantel Viridis. At that time, the Viridis was a uh, a revolutionary change in, in laser because it was a small package diode laser. It allowed you to do retinal laser and also cyclodiode laser in one, one little machine. And it was a fantastic machine to use and very, very helpful. But now we've moved on 17 years on. We have now much, much better machines. And I'm going to just spend a few minutes explaining to you the features of modern laser machines that have ex allowed us to be much safer and more effective in our treatment of our patients with uh, diabetic macular edema. And what are the features that we have here? There are two, and I'm going to focus on one today. Number one is the pattern scanner, which is also widely available in many other laser machines. You can now laser rapidly with a variety of sizes and patterns and shapes at very, very short uh, pulses, 0.01 seconds, um, and hardly felt by the patient. Secondly, which I'm going to talk about is a sub-threshold laser, which allows us to do macular laser extremely safely without any signs of retinal scarring, but very effective at reducing macular edema. So sub threshold laser actually has been around for many, many years. Uh, in 1990, Pankratov, which was a, a laser physicist, thought of this idea of chopping up your, your continuous laser beam into little pockets of, of pulses to reduce the, the heat on the retina. But it was only in 2005, uh, Jeff Lutro published his first paper using the diode 810 nanometer sub threshold laser. And only in 2008, where commercially available uh, 532 green and 577 yellow uh, sub threshold laser machines were made available and now widely available in the last uh, five to ten years. And in 2011, there was a randomized control trial done in the US which showed that sub threshold diode laser was more effective than conventional laser for treatment of diabetic macular edema. This was laser laser study, no anti VEGF involved. So, as uh, Victor already said um, from protocol T, laser still plays a critical role in the treatment of diabetic macular edema. You have to bear in mind these patients were treated with traditional focal laser from the, the, um, the old uh, laser studies done in the 80s, 1980s. And in a large proportion of them, even after treatment with uh, ranubizumab or even trimcinolone, a large proportion of them still require laser treatment. And in the protocol T, just to highlight to you, the patients um, only use conventional laser and only after six months were they allowed to have laser after intensive uh, anti-VEGF therapy. And they, they were the specific criteria on that. And Victor already showed a significant proportion of them required laser after six months of intensive anti-VEGF therapy. 
So here you can see uh, one of the patients uh, who had conventional laser. So I just want to highlight to you now the weaknesses of conventional laser. You can see a typical diabetic macroedema with heart exudates. And you can see a year after laser, you can see these white laser scars very close to the macula. And those of you that have been in practice for many years, you know that these laser scars were pigment and large with time and have a, a condition called macular creep where it gets closer and closer to the fovea and the patient may notice a drop in their vision over years. What is micropulse laser? I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Essentially, it is where we break up the laser pulse into multiple discrete uh, pockets of laser, and you can control it with a, uh, something called duty cycle, where it, it is a percentage of time that the laser is on compared to the percentage of time the laser is off. This off time is essential because it helps cooling of the RPE and prevents the formation of uh, pigmented scars at the retina itself. So we did this study um, many years ago in, when in KL when we first got the micropulse laser. I did a randomized control trial comparing the conventional uh, green laser with the subthreshold yellow laser. And th at that time, anti VEGF, uh, the results for anti VEGF were still not out yet. So we, we had ethical approval to compare a laser to laser study. And what we showed was that the improvement in the best corrected vision from baseline was equivalent in both groups. So this was proof of concept essentially that the subthreshold yellow laser was as safe as the conventional laser and this was using older treatment guidelines. In those days we were still unsure about the protocols for treatment and we were using an older protocol of 15% duty cycle with a, a, a bit longer time and a bit more def um, not so focused um, laser beam and I'll explain to you in a few slides later what is the recommended treatment parameters for doing micropulse laser. And this is one of the patients in the trial that had the but at the subthreshold laser, you can see quite significantly that a center involving macular edema, and a year after the treatment, they had a significant uh, back to no, almost normalization of the macular contour and visual acuity. And this is one of Victor's uh, favorite slides. Uh, where in the initial studies that he did almost 10 years ago, using the old diode 810 nanometer micropulse laser uh, before and after uh, doing the laser, where one year on, you do not see the laser scars at all, but there is significant reduction in the macular edema. So what now, to talk briefly about the wavelength. Why is yellow 577 nanometer important? If you see here, at the 577 nanometer wavelength range, there's very, very good absorption of the, of the uh, laser by the hemoglobin, but almost no absorption by the uh, xanthophyll pigments at the macula. And this is why the yellow laser is safe for macular laser treatment. You do not cause significant damage to the xanthophyll pigments compared to the 532 conventional green, which has still some absorption by the xanthophyll pigments at the macula. And this is why laser companies are focusing exclusively on this wavelength now. And it's only in the last five to 10 years that it's available, they can do it in a diode, in a very small uh, form, a way of, of a, a, a possible laser format. Before this, yellow lasers were in big uh, machines because they had to be created by halogen gas. But now it can be done with a diode chip. So there's very good absorption of the oxyhemoglobin, very good penetration with patients with cataract, and low absorption by the macular xanthophilmians, causing less phototoxicity. So these are the parameters. If there's one slide you want to remember from this morning, if you are still awake, maybe you want to spend some time just having a look at these parameters. I think Quantel will be able to hand out, give you leaflets about what is recommended. We use a spot size of 160 microns, a longer duration of 200 milliseconds, and just a duty cycle of 5%, which is very low, okay? And it's important now, the next step is the confusion that we often get. Some companies um, with laser machines say you use a fixed power for whatever patient, but for us, we believe, Victor and I believe, that it's important to titrate the power because every patient has differing pigmentations in the retinal pigment epithelium. So what you do is you have to titrate outside the macular area, you test with the laser, um, with 5% duty cycle, and you might say in, at 700 milliwatts of power, you then see a burn. So what you must do then is reduce the power by 50% and laser over the macula in the thickened area with your contact lens. And that will give you a very safe uh, um, um, protocol for treating the macula. You do not see a burn. You do not want to see any burns or laser marks, but you will definitely have a uh, treatment effect. And how do you guide your treatment? You look at your OCT. You look at where the exudates are, you look at your 3D scleroscopic vision on your, on your contact lens. And what we recommend is very dense treatment. The, the laser spots have to be touching each other. We don't want them to be separated apart. 
And this is a patient uh, that had a diabetic macular edema. You can see an angiogram. There's some leakage centrally, a central involving macular edema. And what I look at is the macular map. So this is the area that I want to treat, the thickened area on the macular map. And I think with time, we'll be able to have systems of overlays. Where you're doing the laser, you can see in one eye the macular map that can guide you better on treating it. So you don't have to look at a piece of paper on the side in the room. And after treatment one year, you can see there's a reduction in the macular edema with the micropulse laser, when no signs of any laser scars and autofluorescence or micropyrimetry. How can you improve this further? And this is where the, I feel the Quantel machine comes into its own because it manages to combine the pattern and the micropulse all in one package. So you have, can use what we call a macular grid. You can shape the, do the pattern according to the macular edema and just press your foot down and just treat the whole area in just under one minute. If the patient happens to move, if you lift the pedal up, the laser will stop in the middle of the pattern and then when you put the pedal down, it will resume continuing at the same pattern again. There is a center fixation light where the patient will use their pho phobia to fixate on that allows you to make sure that the patient is not moving during the, during the laser. So, this is what you use. If you have a diabetic macular edema without foveal involvement, you can use a, a macular quadrant like this. Set up the um, parameters and just press your foot pedal and treat away. How does subthreshold laser work? This is a question I get asked all over the world whenever I give talks like this. We do not know exactly, but essentially the low, density, low intensity laser spots are not meant to damage the RPE. We do not aim to treat microaneurysms like what you were told before for your focal treatment. You need a high density spot placement over the entire layer of macular edema, and this appears to work by normalizing RPE function. Some basic science work done shows that there is altered cytokine expression in patients that are with macular edema, and after you treat with the uh, micropulse, there is a reduction in the cytokine expression, and this seems to be have a, a treatment benefit. When should you start? If you're going to start next week after you get back from Singapore, I'm sure all of us will go back with many new ideas, excited to implement, to improve our care of our patients. I would pick patients with extra foveal macular edema. I would pick patients that are, have a fear of needles, that um, have previously failed on anti-VEGF or steroids. And, and then you can start treatment um, with these patients. These would be the ideal patients to start with. How close you go to the fovea, I don't go directly over the fovea, but you can go within 50 microns, and that seems to work very well as well. And then again, that's an argument we often get. Can you treat over the fovea region? Personally, I wouldn't recommend it. If you have a very thickened retina involving the fovea, I would start with injections to reduce the edema, and after maybe after six months, if there's still persisting edema, you, you can combine it with laser. But as Victor has mentioned before in previous talks, we can never get a, such a study of anti-VEGF combined with micropulse or subthreshold laser because there's no um, anti-VEGF company who want to fund such a study because it would then reduce their number of injections they sell. And similarly, a laser company cannot have the budget to spend on all that money on anti-VEGF injections. So we may never see such a study. What should you tell your patient? You have to be patient. As we're doing any form of uh, focal laser, it takes time to take effect. The, the response may take up to three months but it lasts a long time. So, and it can also be repeated, like a focal laser treatment. After three months of doing micropulse, uh, subthreshold laser, if the patient still has persisting macular edema, you can then repeat the laser at the areas of thickening seen on OCT. Um, and there's often subjective improvement in vision, even if you still see thickening on the OCT. So in summary, we know that DME is a huge burden to our healthcare systems. In this part of the world, it is not feasible to do monthly anti-VEGF injections for our patients. They can't afford it. Our governments cannot afford it. Insurance companies cannot afford it. The subthreshold laser with the yellow wavelength is a safe and effective option. It can reduce the treatment burden of injections. And now that we have the latest um, ma machines with the upgraded software, with pattern, subthreshold mode, all in one, um, you know, we, if we, it's a very exciting area in, in retinal laser therapy. Many different manufacturers may have different names for their subthreshold. For example, micropulse, barely visible burns, or subthreshold. But essentially, they're all the same thing. Same thing. They're software systems designed to do safe and effective laser therapy. And I believe this is a standard of care in retinal laser therapy now. So in summary, I'd like to invite you to Malaysia in December, where we'll be having more symposiums on this, and we'll also have workshops to, to teach you how to do practical, practically how to handle such uh, cases in real life. Thank you very much.